<laughs> yeah. So uh, first of all, Guyan, thanks so much for having me, and and I appreciate the opportunity to to speak to you and 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 your colleagues, and and uh, and and this is this is truly a wonderful opportunity. So, um, uh, real quick, just a little bit about myself. I'm a 30 year retired colonel. I live in Vienna now, and and I've been writing uh, numerous articles for Newsweek, uh, The Hill. Um, I've been in the Kiev Post numerous times. As a matter of fact, I have an article coming out today. Um, but uh, so, yeah, so I'm, I'm intimately familiar with go what's going on in Ukraine and Russia. And of, of course, I was stationed as the senior military attache assigned to Pristina and Kosovo for two years. So also quite familiar with the Balkans. Um, but to your question, right, to your point, uh, the, I, I think that if we reflect about the last year, the, the first thing is, that's very tragic is there's been a, a massive uh, amount of loss of life, right? We're talking hundreds of thousands of soldiers from both sides, right? So war war takes its toll on both sides. Uh, and that's catastrophic because this didn't have to happen, right? There, there's one person in this world, right, that made the decision to make this happen, and that is Vladimir Putin, uh, the president of Russia. So it's important today to have a discussion about uh, information operations, information uh, propaganda um, and disinformation because he is the, the king of it, if you will, right? I think that Vladimir Putin today is a little disappointed. Right? I think that he really believed that this would be a three to six month excursion into Kiev. He would decap decapitate the country. Uh, he would cut off the capital from the rest. Uh, he would find Zelensky, put him in prison, and eventually Russia would be consumed. Uh, excuse me, Ukraine would be consumed into Russia. And clearly that didn't happen. And he had to have a retreat out of the north, back up into Belarus. And now the fighting is 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 heavy. Uh, out on the eastern front of of Ukraine, right? Um, he's lost a lot of lives. He's lost a lot of tanks. He's he's lost a lot of resources and assets. So I think he is he's quite upset. Uh, if you're from the Ukrainian side and the West, I, I think that you're surprised and and optimistic. Uh, I, there were very few people back a year ago that truly thought that Ukraine had a chance in this fight, and to see them stand up to what was perceived to be the second largest or the second most powerful military in the world. Um, uh, is is quite impressive. Uh, it speaks volumes to the amount of information operations and, and disinformation and propaganda that that Russia spread about their military capabilities. Clearly, many of these were inflated or exaggerated, or if not outright lies. Right. So um, we can start with with talking about different disinformation merely on the on the aspect of of what his military capabilities were thought to be and what they truly turned out to be. To me, it's very interesting. Uh, I, I just wrote my my second fiction thriller called uh, Balkan Reprisal, which is just a, it's it's a hundred percent about this this issue, right? The the friction and the and the tension that exists between uh, between Serbia and Kosovo and the the oligarchs, uh, the wealthy, the powerful, Vladimir Putin. Um, they're all in the book, right? Uh, and you know uh, the the funny the funny thing is is my my former ambassador to Kosovo, Ambassador Delawi, he argues you know this is as close to to, to reality that fiction truly gets. So I, I think I I have a little bit of ability to speak on this issue, right? And and what what always puzzles me is uh, over the last seven years, Serbia has become more and more and more and more isolated. And even though they're isolated. Um, uh, President Vucic still hitches his horse, if you will, to to Putin, right? And he is extremely tied. Uh, their their Slavic brotherhood, right? To 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 Moscow and to Putin. And you know, at this point, uh, Serbia is is an island in a NATO ocean, right? They're completely surrounded by NATO countries. Um, so I, I don't I don't know. I mean, if if I was them, I would be I, I would be looking far more west. Then I would be looking east. Uh, the I think that the West has given uh, President Vucic many opportunities. Uh, he is a part. The, they are a partner for Peace Nation. Uh, they're they've started their their uh, opening chapters into the European Union, but he just doesn't seem to really gravitate towards the West. And that relationship that he has with with Vladimir Putin it, it seems to be unbending. Up until a, a few months ago, right? They're starting to see signs that Vucic and Putin's relationship is breaking. Um, Vucic is in a really tough situation from a strategic perspective, and and I'll explain on that. Right, he does not support. Right, he's come out positive numerous times and said he does not support uh, Russia violating the borders of Ukraine. And of course, he has to say that because if he says that um, you know that he supports the invasion and that nation's borders aren't um, the integrity of a nation's borders aren't sound and resolute, 
then there's an argument that Kosovo should have its independence. So he can't have both, right? He can either support that he wants, you know, a, a whole of Serbia back and he doesn't want Kosovo to exist, or he can support Vladimir Putin and say that, you know, Vladimir Putin should have Serbia, but you can't have both. So he's starting to have um, challenges with Moscow and, and with the Kremlin. And, and maybe that's a good thing, right? Yeah, so North Kosovo is, is tragic, right? When I was there from 2016 to 2018, uh, this was the, the time frame that Oliver Ivanovic was shot, was assassinated, I didn't say shot. He was, he was gunned down in broad daylight, assassinated at point blank range with handguns outside of his office. Uh, and, you know, um, nobody at the time, nobody saw a thing, right? It was all the all the security cameras and the CTTVs were comp were off or they weren't working. And, and this is just it's it's tragic, right? Because what uh, Mr. Ivanovich truly really wanted to do is he wanted to work with Kosovo and find a way forward. And and that was not going to that did not sit well in Belgrade uh, or whoever killed him, wherever that was. Right. I, I like some of the dialogue, some of the dialogue that's going on in that the the efforts at, at building some kind of relationship between um, the Serbs in Kosovo, right, the ethnic Serbs of Kosovo, and the the Albanians of Kosovo to become truly a nation of Kosovars, right? I think that 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 passions towards ethnicities um, are are extremely strong in the region uh, and understandable. I, I don't I don't dismiss that. But, you know, if you ask, you know, I, 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 I look at the situation from a different perspective, right? I'm an American. I'm a German American, but I have German, British, uh, French blood in me. I, I have I have a lot of different, you know, ethnicities inside of me, but I'm an American. And, and that is the flag that I I stand under. Um, you don't you don't have the same kind of feeling in Kosovo. And I think for Kosovo to truly exist as a multi-ethnic nation, that's a good thing. I, I will say, right, that um, when I was there, my lead effort in the strategy to help Kosovo was actually to get Kosovo to move a KSF towards a, a towards a true military, to our, towards a true army. And I, I would tell you that while you still have a KS, you have a Ministry of Defense, and it was efforts that I took along with your senior leaders um, in, in a strategic level to get Kosovo to have a, a, an army. And what I mean by that was our strategy, real quick, was to was to overinflate the KSF with Kosovo Serbs. In other words, to have actually a percentage of Kosovo Serbs in the KSF even greater than the percentage that existed in the population, because it was very hard for for Belgrade to argue, argue that the KSF was nothing more than the Uchika uh, in a different uniform if there were a bunch of Serbs in the in the KSF, right? So here you have a perfect example example where multi ethnicity in the KSF was recognized by European nations like Germany and England and the United and, and also the United States and other nations say, okay, yeah, this really isn't the Uchika. The KSF truly is a multi-ethnic uh, entity. And, and we believe that, you know, right now perhaps isn't the right time, but we're not going to stop it. We're not going to get in the way. So case of Kosovo transitioned from a ministry of the KSF to the ministry of defense. Uh, and that was a great day, right? And I'm very proud of Kosovo for that. But that took and that took efforts in a multi-ethnic relationship to, to advance. Well, so my 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 comments to my friends in the Balkan is stay resolute and stay true to your nation. Uh, believe in believe in the believe in the rule of law and believe in democracy. Right. Believe in the freedom of democracy. The, the beautiful thing about Kosovo, North Macedonia, Montenegro, Croatia, um, Albania is all of these people have tasted democracy. They've tasted freedom, right? And it tastes good. Uh, I, I, I love it. Right? And um, it, it infuriates Vladimir Putin uh, that these nations can be free, that they can have democratic elections. Uh, and and it, it, he hates, he literally to, the, to his core hates the concepts of free and fair elections and, and democracy. So what I tell him, stay, stay, stay true. You're a hundred percent correct. They, 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 they tried to, you know, they tried to uh, interfere in, in Montenegro with, you know, this potential uh, uprising and, and North Macedonia. Um, Vladimir Putin's number one strategy for a very long time was to break apart NATO, right? He didn't like the alliance uh, looking across uh, towards Russia uh, from the east. He hated, it, right? When he looked at west and he saw this unified front of democratic nations all aligned together, he hated. 
this this was visceral to him. He didn't like it. So he he would take tons of actions to tear apart NATO. He didn't want it to grow. He didn't want it to encroach on on his lands. Now, I, I think it's important to point out, yes, NATO has advanced, but these nations voluntarily step forward and say they want to join. NATO NATO's not going to them and and you know burdening them and overpowering them and twisting their arm and saying you must become part of our alliance. You know, it, it's the alliance is such a good thing that nations out there voluntarily say, hey, I, I I'd like to kind of join your club, and that's a good thing, right? But where Vladimir Putin made one of his most strategic mistakes was the attack into Ukraine, because if his if his true strategic intent was to break up NATO. That action alone solidified NATO to be stronger than it has been in the last three decades, right? NATO is unified on a common front. All leaders of NATO are marching to the same beat. They are stepping with the same foot and they are moving in the same direction. So his effort to destroy NATO has catastrophically failed in the last two years.